Let's open together to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. I want to welcome everyone here to our uh, worship service. We have a few here and uh, many more that are, are watching in other places. Thank you for joining us and thinking together with us about the things of God, worshiping God with us. Uh, this is something that Christians have done from the very beginning. Uh, I was reading just this morning about um, what happens on the first day of the week where the women go to the tomb. And uh, they are told, why do you seek the dead, uh, the living among the dead? And uh, he's not here, he is risen. And uh, in the first century, you see disciples gathering on the first day of the week, remembering what Jesus has done for them, taking of the Lord's Supper together. And so we, we celebrate because the tomb is empty, and we celebrate because our Lord has been sacrificed for us. And as I thought about those things, I thought about particularly what, in my view is the most important part for our time right now of what it means that Jesus was risen from the dead, that Jesus wasn't still in the grave. And I thought uh, there are some ways that that truly impacts you and me, especially in the time that we live in. And I thought I'd, I'd share some of those thoughts with you uh, about the idea of death and what Jesus teaches us or shows us about death because of his resurrection. So I want to begin just by reading here in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. These are the words of Paul. 2 Timothy 4 and 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So these are the last words of Paul that we have. He knows he's about to die. In fact, he knows that the process has already begun. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. But what is impressive about these words, and I think one of the reasons these words resonate with us through the centuries, is their confidence. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He's ready, and he knows what happens next. And I want us to think, about how we, when we are in the position Paul is in, where we are facing death, how we can face death with confidence like that. And the reason that is relevant to me is that there's been a lot of talk about death lately. Uh, there's a lot of talk about a virus that can lead to death. And we think about that. In fact, daily we see statistics of the numbers of death, so much so that it kind of, uh, we, we lose the personal touch of it. You know, we lose the sense that that's a real person. Instead, we all just become numbers, and we're tempted to simply see stats instead of people. But in our sober moments, we think about our own deaths. The Hebrew writer tells us that it is appointed to man to die once, and after this, the judgment. And if Jesus doesn't return first, we will die. That time will come for you and for me. And that thought is chilling. Because the thing about death is it forces us to face whether we really deep down all the way, really believe the things that the Bible teaches. Because what happens next after death is a question that we believe we know the answer to, but that's the moment when we'll have to say whether we truly believe. And the other part of it is when we have death in mind, it helps us to think clearly about life. It, it resets our paradigm where suddenly the things that we thought were important are less important when we look at the fact that life has an end and that we need to be living in such a way that when the end comes, we can face death with confidence. So that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes this morning. I want us to learn from Paul how to face death with confidence. Particularly, I want us to see what a man who's facing his own death thinks really matters. And as we go through that, I think we'll see these are the things that matter to you and me as well, and how you and I can live in preparation for that time. So what matters when we face death? The first thing that matters is our labor. See, people who face death look back over their lives, and they have the question, have I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish? Am I proud of my life, or am I happy with what I did? Do I have peace? And I want you to see, as we go through all of these, this is important, I've got three things I want to talk about this morning. And in each one, there is a part of it where we have to come to terms with something. 
and there is a part of it where we have a hope of something. So when we talk about our labor, we have to come to terms with the fact that what we have done is what we have done. We have to come to terms with that, come to peace with it, if we're going to face death with confidence. So look at Paul. Look at verse 6 here of 2 Timothy 4. In first, 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So he says, the end is coming, I'm being poured out, but I have fought the good fight. I look back on my life and I am confident that I have worked hard in the right things. I have been fighting the right fight. I have finished the race, he says. I've been running and the time has come for me to hang it up. I'm done. He doesn't say, by the way, I think this is interesting, he doesn't say, I won the race. He says, I finished the race. It's over. I don't have any more else to run. It doesn't matter how I competed against other people. That's not the issue here. The issue is I have run it and I have completed it. So when Paul knows that he has spent his life in the right pursuits, then he can die with confidence. And that's what gives him confidence in these last moments. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. This is another time where Paul talks about uh, at least not maybe as imminent a death, but he is thinking about his own death. Philippians 1 and verse 19, he says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, time out. What's happening here is Paul is in prison, and he's saying, Pray for me, and I'm sure that I'll be released because you're praying for me. Verse 20, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with full cur that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So he says, I, I believe, I, I'm convinced that I'm going to be released because you're praying for me. But he reveals his heart about the possibility that he might die. He talks about in verse 20 that he hopes that he will not be at all ashamed. That is, he wants to face the situation confidently. I don't want to do anything now that's going to somehow be different from the life that I've led. You know, it would be a shame, he is saying, if I led this life for Christ and then I got to the end and I did something that made me ashamed. I would hate to do that and kind of sully the rest. But he also says, and I'm drawn to this in verse 20, that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. I love those words, as always. He says, nothing has changed for me. It's the same as it's always been. I lived a life for the Lord, and now I'm going to die a death for the Lord. And no matter whether I'm living or dying, whether somebody is hurting me or not, whatever happens, I'm going to honor Christ in my body. I'm going to serve him with what I've got. Nothing has changed for me just because I'm facing death. And so Paul is confident because he says, I'm just going to die the way I've lived, serving the Lord. So for Paul, death is merely the last lap of the race. It's just the, the way we get to the finish line. And I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not scared of the end, because the end just means I finally finished. I've been working my whole life toward this, and now I just want to finish well. I just want to honor Christ with my body. So, I am impressed with those words. And the fact that, in studying for this, I found several times where people talked about dying well as a way of glorifying God. Let me show you a couple of those. This is Jesus in John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, talking about he's at the end of his life. He knows he's about to suffer. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So you glorify. I'm not worried about myself. I'm going to die, but I want you to be glorified. That's the focus. When he talks to Peter, this is John 21. He says, this is Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young... You used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Isn't that interesting? The death that would glorify God. Now, in both of those cases, Jesus and Peter, including probably Paul, there's going to be some kind of martyrdom. They're going to die for their faith. So I understand that's a little different than probably what you and I expect to face in terms of death. What he is saying, though, I think is universal. When Paul says, I want to glorify God in my body, 
or they're going to die in a way that glorifies God. The point is, we glorify God when we face death with confidence. That's what these men are doing. And why is that? It's because what other hope, what other allegiance could we have that would say, I'm going to go into death with my head held high. I know what happens next. You can kill me for this. It does not bother me because I know where I go when this ends. So death becomes the last part of our labor, the last step in which we serve and trust Jesus. But we have to talk about this. Because one of the main reasons we fear death is that we struggle with what we have and have not accomplished, what we might call our labor. We're especially concerned that we're not going to be able to complete what we've started. You know, maybe we've started something in our families. Or maybe we've started something in a career. Or maybe we've started something in a local church. And we say, I I just don't know what's going to happen with that. I want to see it through all the way to the end. And I'm not at peace. Sometimes we're concerned that our lives will be spent and we won't have made a difference. So we can't look back and say, this is the good I did. Sometimes we look back and we have a lot of regrets. I've especially noticed this when I've talked to people who've spent a long time away from the Lord. And they say, or a long time where they were just sort of spiritually lazy. And they say, I just have so much regret about that time that I wasted. So they face, in those situations, they face death reluctantly because they are disappointed with their lives. They, they look at their labor and they say, this was not what I wanted it to be. But I want to push back on that a little. Because if you think about Paul, Paul had a lot of dreams, ambitions. In fact, he talks about The fact that he really wanted to go preach in Spain. He mentions this in the book of Romans. And as I read the New Testament, Paul never got to Spain. Paul spent large portions of his life in prison. Unfairly, for no real clear reason. He had persecuted Christians and had been a violent blasphemer. When he looks back on that, don't you think he has some shame about that? Regret? Part of facing death is that we need to come to terms with the fact that our lives will not be lived flawlessly. We will all have regrets. We will all have things that we say, I wish that had gone different. I wish I had done this. I didn't think this would happen the way it happened. We won't accomplish everything we'd like to. We won't make the biggest difference. But what makes Christians different is that our lives still matter. That's the thing with the world. In the world's eyes, it only matters if you make that difference. But not so with the Lord. So it is that when we face death, we look at our labor in a different way. Paul says it this way. He says, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, 24. So Paul says, I'm just at the end. I just want to finish my course. I just want to do what Jesus commissioned me to do. And this is just the last step. That's how I view my life. So I can be confident that when my life ends, it is not the end of the importance of my life. My service to God will be remembered. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, this is a chapter where Paul has been talking about the resurrection. And if there is no resurrection, then we are all just wasting our time. And he says, we are of all men the most to be pitied. This is a miserable life, and we're wasting our time and effort. But because we know Jesus rose from the dead, because the tomb was found empty, he says, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Everything you do is remembered by God, including the things that you do that don't see any reward now. So Jesus is going to say things like, Whoever gives a cup of cold water in my name will by no means lose his reward. That there is a reward for the small acts, the service that no one cares about or notices, the the life that maybe even in your own life you don't remember what you've done. But Jesus remembers. And so when we face death, our focus shrinks. It's okay that we didn't do everything that we hoped to do. The question of importance in that moment is, Did we work for Jesus? That's what matters. Did we finish the course? Did we fight the good fight? Did we keep the faith? What matters when we face death? The second thing is our people. Our people. As we face death, we think about our loved ones. And we lament being separated from them. 
We want to be sure they know how much we love them. We want to end our lives with no hard feelings. But there is also the idea of what happens when we are gone to the people that we care about. And so we're thoughtful about that. Sometimes that means we're going to get some life insurance or find out that they're taken care of financially. Very often it's going to be, I want them to be prepared for the time when I'm not with them in whatever way that, that uh, manifests itself. So we're here in Philippians 1. Look with me in Philippians 1 and verse 21. Paul writes, Philippians 1, 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So he says, and, and you've probably heard this phrase used before in verse 21, to live as Christ and to die as gain. Well, what does that mean? What he means is, he, he is viewing the two options, living and dying, going on with my life or letting this be the end of my life. And he says, to live, to continue in the, in the flesh, will mean I keep serving Christ. To live is Christ. And that has a particular application for Paul. That meant he was going to serve the Philippians. And so he talks about that. In verse 22, he says, it will be fruitful labor for me. In verse 24, he says, um, I'm, it, it will be more necessary on your account. And verse 25, I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So I'm going to keep teaching you and working with you. And that's what it means. If I keep living, I keep serving Christ, I keep serving you. But to die is gain. Because he says in verse 23, I get to go and be with Christ which is far better. So he says, either way things go, I'm good. If I keep living, keep serving Christ, keep helping you, get to see you grow, that'd be great. But if I die, that'd be even better. Far better, he says. So Paul doesn't think the time will be now. But he says, when I go, I want to know that I'm going to be with Christ and that you will continue it will affect you in a good way. In fact, he talks about that more in Philippians 2. You can see this focus on other people, particularly in 2 Timothy. I want you to turn over with me to 2 Timothy. So I mentioned earlier that uh, 2 Timothy is the last thing we have from Paul uh, as he is at the end of his life. But it's clear as you read 2 Timothy, I'm going to start in chapter 1 here. Um, as you're reading 2 Timothy, it's clear that he is thinking about other people. And I want you to just notice, we're just going to go through several verses rapid fire here. And I want you to see how many different things he is thinking and saying about other people. 2 Timothy 1, first of all, he's writing to Timothy, right? Timothy is going to come visit him in uh, Roman custody. 2 Timothy 1 and 15, You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived at Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him, mercy, grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Chapter 2, verse 17. He says, Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. Turn over to chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 9. 2 Timothy 4, 9, Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Now you can hear in that just the how many people. He mentions people who have done right by him and people who have done wrong by him. Onesephorus was a great guy, seems to have died. He says, I want a blessing on the household of Onesephorus. 
But then you've got Hymenaeus and Philetus, and these people who have taught wrong things, or Alexander the coppersmith who did me much harm, or Demas who forsook me, and all these different men who have left me. In fact, everybody left me. Everybody in Asia, he says, turned away from me. Now, what, what's Paul doing here? I think, at least in my reading, I think this is Paul making his peace with everybody. He's trying to say, as much as I can, this is the last word I'm going to say about this situation. Some of them even have these statements of ultimate fates, like, may he find mercy from the Lord. May it not be charged against him, or may the Lord repay him according to what he's done. As if Paul is saying, I'm done. I want to face my death with no hard feelings. In fact, I find it interesting that as he faces death, one of the people he calls for is Mark, John Mark. The one that he had such a problem with Barnabas about years back. He seems to care most of all about people. And then and when people have failed him, he says, don't worry, the Lord is still with me. So I see, and, and I think it is natural for us to think this way. When we face death with confidence, it's because we want to say, I don't have any loose ends. The people that I needed to say something to, I've said it. The things that I needed to resolve, I've resolved. And I'm ready to go. But there is also this thread that runs through Paul's writings and work, and really through a number of godly men throughout the Bible. That is, when they face death with confidence, it is because they have prepared the next generation to step into the role that they're leaving behind. So you see that. I mean, Paul is writing who? He's writing Timothy. And he has been prepping Timothy for years for this role. And not only Timothy, but, but Titus and Silas and all these other men that he has taken with him to do the work, shown them, written to them, and now he's ready to go because he knows the work will continue in good hands. And you can face death with confidence knowing that, right? That my work is in good hands. Moses names Joshua before he goes. David names Solomon. Elijah gets Elisha, although I, as I thought about that, Elijah didn't actually die, so I think that's a different uh, situation. But I want you to notice, uh, the idea of prepping other people is not something that we can do suddenly. Where we're about to die and we say, hey, you got it. It's something that we have to be working and developing people but slowly over time to be prepared for the time when we are no longer here. There's work. There's forethought. There has to be great care in it. And then, when it's time to go, we can be confident. Peter says this. This is 2 Peter 1, verse 12. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, the things he's just written about. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And that's when Jesus told him, you're going to die this way, uh, back in John 21. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So what he's saying is, I'm writing this down so that you remember it, because I'm not going to be here long. And I don't want all the things that I know and would teach you to die with me. So I write it down, and I send it to you, and I want to keep reminding you so that you can keep remembering and it's powerful because Peter's words are still with us. Even though Peter's body, we, we don't have him in the flesh anymore. When we face death, we have to come to terms with the fact that we're going to be separated from the people we love. And that hurts. And that's sad. And I, I'm not saying it in a glib way. But I'm saying when we face death with confidence, we have to be prepared for that fact. But what helps us the confidence, the assurance that we have is that after we're gone, they have the memories of the things that we have done with them and tried to teach them, the preparations we have made for them, and the things that our lives were intended to teach them and help them with. So when we face death, we have confidence when we know that while we may be separated, that's not the end and that we have made preparation for this. The other thing, and I'll just mention this briefly, is that Paul certainly seems to be expecting to be reunited with the people he loves. Because when he talks about Jesus coming back in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, those who are dead are going to be raised, and those of us who are alive will be together 
and we'll go up together to meet the Lord in the air. I don't think that that together is incidental. That we'll be together again and thus we'll always be with the Lord. So there is confidence in knowing that this also is not the last time we'll see one another. What matters when we face death? The third thing I want to talk about is our future. This is, of course, the main issue. It's personal. And while we could talk a lot about, well, looking backward, and we can talk a lot about, well, how do we think about our, our people that we love so much, I think the thing that gives us pause about death is, is what happens to us. Where do we go? What's next? And Paul can approach death with confidence because he knows where he's going. Look again, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8 here. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you notice that you and I are in that last part of the verse there? Not only to me. It's not just Paul's reward. Everyone who has loved his appearing, all of us have that hope of a crown of righteousness. And Paul is certain that his death is not the end. Sometimes we struggle with focusing our Bible study and our attention, even as a congregation. We just tend to do this, where we focus on what happens right now. And we focus on personal growth, and we focus on doctrinal precision, and we focus on what the church does and our work together. We know that it's important to think about the eternal dimensions of our faith, but we don't really focus on them that often. But suddenly, when we are facing death, that's all that really matters, right? That's really where our focus is. And so facing death and thinking about death gives us clarity that we don't have at other times. So in that moment, we want some things that we can hold on to. Say, yes, I am certain about that. And I want to spend just a moment here looking at three passages of how Paul describes what comes next. The first is in Philippians 3. Philippians 3 and verse 10. Remember, Paul has already said, we've already read, that when he dies, he says, I'll depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 3 and verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he says, my desperate passion is to know him and the power of his resurrection. He says in verse 11 that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is Paul's only concern. I know I'm going to die. What happens next? And so he has found in Jesus someone who can beat death. And he says, I want that. I will seek that. I am passionate about that. And he says in verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God calling me to himself, that's what I'm looking for. So because Jesus was raised from the dead, we have hope that we will be raised from the dead as well. That's what Paul centered his life around. When he says, I'll depart and be with Christ, this is what he's thinking. He's thinking about that resurrection. Second passage is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Beginning in verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed. Now let's just set our bearings here. When he talks about a tent, he's talking about our body. And the body is a tent, that it is a house for our true essence. But it's a tent, which means it is a temporary body. And we know that part of that has to do with its mortality. It's going to die. It's not a permanent body. We know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, if we die, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. 
We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So tents and buildings here are pictures of bodies. We have a temporary body now, and we groan because we want a better body, a body that doesn't ache all the time, a body that doesn't break down and die. We want a permanent body, a body that's not subject to viruses, a body where we don't get sick. And he says we will have that body. So what he says now is we walk by faith that that's going to happen because we haven't seen it yet. But we know that whether we are here or with him, whether we're in this body or in that future body, all we want is to please the Lord. So you see what he's saying. It's just like what we said in the first point. Death is just another step in following Jesus. It's just another part of our service to him. The third passage is in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. We're just thinking about how Paul thought about his own future as he faced death and thought about death. Romans 8 and verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What he is saying is because of these promises, when we belong to Christ, nothing can separate us. Nothing. I want you to remember that Christians in the first century went to their deaths willingly. They were willing to suffer and be killed. In fact, he talks about that in verse 36 there, where he says, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. So he is not saying, hey, I hope everything works out and maybe God will come through and you don't die. He's saying, no, even if you die, even if someone brings the sword against you, even if you're in a famine, even if you don't have the clothes you need, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. The reason these people went to their deaths willingly is because they truly believed that the Lord who conquered his death could give them victory over death. And so Paul will talk confidently about this. He says in another place, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. That there is a sense that this is out of our hands. There is something bigger at play than just who we are and what we have done. That is the future that Paul looks forward to. So, there's something to come to terms with here, which is the fact that we're not told everything about what's going to happen next, and this is something we've never experienced, and that we don't really have the record outside of Jesus of someone coming back and telling us what this is like. And that frightens us. But there is also something to give us hope, that Jesus says those who have his have faith in him and his resurrection, now have this power for themselves. So the question is, are we ready for that? Do we really believe in Jesus and his resurrection? There's going to come a time where those are the only questions that are going to matter. So what matters when we face death? Our labor, our people, our future. Here is the good news. For those of us who are still living... These thoughts give us moments of clarity. And that's what death does for us. It focuses our attention on what really matters. If we can live the life of one who has clarity facing death, then it will bless us. So the questions are, when we talk about our labor, how are you spending your time and your life's work? I'm not talking about careers here. I mean, the things you really want to accomplish with your life. Are you doing the things that really matter? And the easy way to test yourself on that is to say, if I were to die today, 
Would I be happy with what I'm doing? How much of our time do we waste? How many things do we spend energy on that just don't matter? This is clear even to worldly people. You know, there's that saying, nobody on their deathbed wishes they had done more work, things like that. What they're saying is, when you die, there's clarity about how you should have spent your life. Wouldn't it be better to live with that clarity now and live our life knowing what we should be doing? When we talk about our people, how are you using your opportunities with your people? God has blessed all of us with some opportunities with people that matter to us. We have chances now to make peace with them, to show love to them, to teach them the things we want to teach them, to say what needs to be said, to help them if we can help them. There will be times where we can no longer do that. We have chances to prepare them for the time when we are no longer with them. How are we using those opportunities? When we talk about our future, how are you in relationship with God? Because you have chances now to make peace with the God that someday you're going to meet. I want to say this. What I am struck by when I look at Paul and I look at men in the Bible who face death is that we don't have to be afraid. In fact, the Hebrew writer says specifically that Jesus has set free those who all their lives were subject to bondage because of the fear of death, subject to slavery. Now, that doesn't mean that, that we all get to face death like Paul. Paul seems to know he's going to die. He seems to have a lot of time to kind of think about it. That doesn't always happen. That's not guaranteed. Not everyone gets to muse on it and prepare themselves for it. We don't have a guarantee that we're going to live a certain number of years. We don't have any of that. And I understand that means that maybe we won't have the same kind of sayings that Paul has. But here is the question that cuts through all of the rest. If your day is today, can you die with confidence? And if not, what needs to change? I pray that you'll think about that. And I pray that if there's change that you need to make, that you'll make it. If we can help you to do that, I pray that you'll reach out to us, especially those who are watching online. Find a way to contact us. You can do that through our website, fairviewparkchurch.com. And we'd love to help you and talk with you about that. If you're here in the building this morning and you want to make a change or let us help you do that, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing to encourage you.